Please remember that the complete information for the class that you are about to view is at elithecomputerguy.com. Not only do we have our videos there, but we have part lists, diagrams, pictures, and even complete code examples. So if you are watching this video and you want more information, please go to elithecomputerguy.com. Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we're going to be doing a walkthrough of the Raspberry Pi operating system. So up until this point, we have learned what the Raspberry Pi is, we have learned how to install the Raspberry Pi operating system, and so now we are going to simply walk through the operating system to get a lay of the land and understand how the operating system works. It is important to understand that basically the Raspberry Pi operating system is simply a distribution of Debian Linux. So Ubuntu is also a distribution of Debian Linux, so if you're used to using Ubuntu, you should be pretty familiar with using the Raspberry Pi operating system. Again, do remember in the Linux world, whenever we talk about operating systems in the Linux world, many times we're basically talking about flavors, customizations, there are specific ways different distributions do things, but they are, are all very similar. And when we talk about different operating systems in the Raspberry Pi world, at least in regards to uh, Linux distributions, we're not talking about the difference between Mac OS versus Linux. Uh, versus Windows OS, right? Those are massively different operating systems. Uh, in the Linux world, when we're talking about these distributions, basically there's just there's little quirks, there's little there's little tweaks. So again, if you understand how to work with Ubuntu uh, using the Raspberry Pi operating system, should be relatively simple. Though, <laughs> of course, it is the Linux world, you might run into some quirks. Uh, so I'm going to be showing you how to use the Raspberry Pi operating system. I will tell you though, I will remind you that you do not have to use the Raspberry Pi operating system on your Raspberry Pi. Again, the Raspberry Pi is a full-fledged computer. It simply uses an ARM processor instead of an x86 processor, and so you can install different distributions of Linux and even a variation of Windows onto the Raspberry Pi. So what operating system you decide to use at the end of the day uh, will be determined on what your particular requirements are. Uh, when we go further into the Raspberry Pi classes, we're actually going to be using the Ubuntu operating system. I personally believe in standardization. We've already done numerous classes in Ubuntu, so I feel that by, by doing standardization, basically bringing Ubuntu over the Raspberry Pi, it gets people up to speed a lot faster, so that's what I will decide to do. But again, in your particular situation, you might find a different distribution of Linux is better for for you with using a Raspberry Pi. So do not feel you're stuck with the Raspberry Pi operating system. Don't feel like, oh, I got a Raspberry Pi, I have to use a Raspberry Pi OS even if I hate it. If you hate it, just go find another distribution, cross your fingers and hope it, hope it actually works on the, on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, but I'm gonna be showing you how to use a Raspberry Pi operating system. One is basically just a good standard uh, place to start with when you're doing the Raspberry Pi. This is a good place just to start, get an idea of how the Python programming works for things like the GPIO outputs. Uh, and then also, as you start to do your own research, as you start to do your own self-study, many of the projects that you will find when you go do Google searches, uh, they will be using the Raspberry Pi operating system in order to create the projects. So if you're comfortable with the Raspberry Pi operating system, then you can figure out how to modify things to work on Ubuntu or modify things to work on a different distribution of Linux, so on and so forth. So it is a good idea to become comfortable with the Raspberry Pi operating system. It is not difficult whatsoever uh, because even if you don't decide to use it going into the, uh, going into the future, it will be a standard place that a lot of tutorials and such will start from. Uh, so with that, let's go over to the computer, just dive in, and I will show you how the Raspberry Pi operating system works. So here we are at the Raspberry Pi operating system. So I've already installed the operating system. I've already done the initial setup. I've already done all of the updates, so on and so forth. And this is basically what we're left with. So we're basically sitting here looking at the desktop. Pretty simple shell of a desktop. If you come up here, uh, the little Raspberry. So we got a little Raspberry thing up here in the upper left-hand corner. And essentially that's the equivalent of the start menu. So you click on the Raspberry and then you get this drop down with all these different options. Uh, right beside this, you have a web browser so this will open the, up the web browser beside that you have the file manager and beside that you have the terminal if you go all the way over to the right hand side you will have your Bluetooth access here you will have your Wi-Fi access right beside that it will also show you what your current IP address is and then right beside that is volume if you have some kind of speaker or whatever plugged into your Raspberry Pi uh, then all you have to do is basically click on the little Raspberry a little start menu and we can go down and start taking a look at what is available 
available when you initially install the operating system. Uh, so under programming, you have the Genie, and then the important uh, programming uh, IDE that we're going to be using a lot is this Thani Python IDE. So Python is the uh, the starting place for being able to interact with the GPIO pens. So the GPIO pens are what allow you to bring inputs from sensors or send outputs to turn on LEDs, that type of thing. And so you're most likely going to be using the Thani Python IDE. And basically, if you click on this, this is the uh, this is the very basic uh, ugly IDE that you get. Uh, so we'll be using this going into the future, and that's where that is located. If we go down, we can see for internet, we have the Chromium web browser. So the Chromium web browser is the open source version of Google Chrome. So basically what Google has done with the Chrome operating system is they've created the Chromium open source uh, web browser, and then what they do is they then tack on uh, whatever proprietary the stuff that they want to to the Chrome browser. So basically anybody can use, develop the Chromium browser um, and then Google basically takes the best parts and takes that over to Chrome. Uh, so here we're using the Chromium browser. Uh, what I will tell you about the Chromium browser is that in many ways it works very well and in some ways it works absolutely awful. <laughs> Yeah, so bad. Uh, things like video, if you go to try to play YouTube videos and other things, you might run into some weird quirky issues. So this is definitely the Chromium browser, not Chrome. Just so one of those things just to, to keep in mind. Uh, if we go down, uh, sound and video. So we have the VLC media player that's built in. The graphics, we have a simple image viewer. And then we come down here to accessories. So there's some interesting stuff with these accessories. Uh, so we have the archiver. So basically this is uh, simply a, like a zip type program, a zip or a tar type program. You have a calculator, you have the file manager, PDF viewer. And then one of the interesting things that you may actually need to use uh, if you need to troubleshoot your Raspberry Pi is a Raspberry Pi diagnostics. So an important thing uh, to realize is that not all micro SD cards are built the same. So that little micro SD card that you slot into uh, your Raspberry Pi, um, again, there's different speeds, there's different qualities of those micro SD cards. So you may simply have have a bad quality micro SD card. So if you're trying to figure out like why one Raspberry Pi works worse than another, or try to figure out why your just yours just doesn't work very well, you may want to run this Raspberry Pi diagnostic. And basically all the diagnostic does is it goes through and it does the SD card speed test. And this will show you uh, basically how fast your SD card is. And so whether or not it's appropriate for running the Raspberry Pi operating system off of. Uh, so again, one of the things in the Linux world and the computer world, Many times, oh, how do I put this? Many times you can have a device or you can have a piece of equipment um, that should not be used uh, in, in a particular uh, project, but still sort of kind of works. Like it sort of kind of boots and it sort of kind of functions, but it's really, really, really kind of crappy. Um, and that's one of the things you can run into with like say the micro SD card. So like with this micro SD card, we can see that it passed. So we know, okay, at least it's a fast enough um, to allow the Raspberry Pi OS to work on the uh, Raspberry Pi. And one of the things I can do is I can come down here to the show log. And if I go to the show log, it will then give me speed. And so again, this is one of the things you can take a look at if you're doing troubleshooting. If one Raspberry Pi works better than another Raspberry Pi, you're trying to figure out why. Literally, one of the reasons might be the micro SD card uh, that you have in there. Uh, so basically, the, the kilobytes per second uh, sequential write. Uh, so a pass. So the target is uh, 10,000, and for this, it's 37,969. So basically, it's four times the sequential write speed. Uh, target for random write speed is 500. This is about twice that particular target. Read speed, the target is 1500, uh, and that again is almost twice as fast. So this kind of shows me, okay, at least I know my micro SD card. Uh, it is it is passing, doesn't seem to be any problems, and it is definitely fast enough. So that as, is actually a very useful tool for you, especially when you're getting used to using a Raspberry Pi, and especially with a lot of people. Like a lot of people, when they get the Raspberry Pi, you you know you're just grabbing a micro SD card off the shelf. <laughs> you're you're not buying the special Uber custom operating system. Uh, micro SD card for your Raspberry Pi, you most likely went, okay, I'll buy the, the Raspberry Pi and then I'll, I'll grab the, the dusty micro SD card off the shelf and I'll just use that. Well, that, that dusty micro SD card is from five or six years ago. The performance might not be uh, what you want it to be. So that's something to look at. Uh, then we go past that for the accessories. We have an SD card copier you're not really going to use. One of the interesting things here is a task manager. So task manager is just like a standard task manager. 
shows you uh, all the different processes, uh, how much the CPU usage is, how much the memory usage is, so on and so forth. So again, if you're starting to have issues with your Raspberry Pi, you can come in here and you can see what the CPU usage is, you can see what the memory usage is, and you can see is the bottleneck actually the Raspberry Pi or not. Do you realize the Raspberry Pi is relatively powerful? I hate to say powerful, powerful is not a great word, but I don't know, it has resources, right? It's a quad core, this particular, the Raspberry Pi 4 is a quad core processor. You've got four gigs of RAM, so on and so forth. So if you're running into the bottleneck issues, it's really tempting. It's really tempting to assume that it's a CPU or it's the memory or something like that. But again, many times in the technology world, the bottlenecks that you're running into are not necessarily where you think the bottlenecks are. Uh, so this is good to, to pop up. And if you're having issues, just actually make sure and see where you are with your CPU usage. Uh, past that, you can right click, you know, you can uh, stop, you can kill, you can reprioritize. Uh, services, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's there uh, if you need that. Uh, then we're going to go up again, take a look at the accessories and go down and we have the terminal. So we'll go into terminal uh, in a few minutes, but basically with a terminal, this gives us our normal Linux terminal. Again, important to understand here, we are using it, you're, we are dealing with a distribution of Debian Linux. So if you understand how Debian Linux works, uh, the same commands will work here. So if I do LSL, again, this basically gives us the, the you know the the list the list in an order command so basically most of the linux commands that you know for debian and ubuntu will work for here if you need to restart services if you need to install software so on and so forth so again like let's say i wanted to install the apache web browser on here so i could do sudo apt oh get install apache 2 and then I can go through, it'll go up the repository, find what's in the repository and actually able to be able to bring it down. And literally I can install the Apache 2 web server onto this Raspberry Pi, literally just like I would if this was an Ubuntu server uh, and it will function essentially the same. It'll, uh, it'll go to the var, www HTML fold, uh, folder, that's where the, the website will be, uh, so on and so forth. We'll have the same type of configuration files and so. Uh, so with that, now that I've installed the Apache web server, if we go back to uh, the Chromium web browser here, I can do 127.0, oops, do 127.0, Point zero point zero point one. Uh, that's the loopback address, and now we can see that I now have Apache Web Server actually installed onto this Raspberry Pi. And so again, all of those Debian commands, most of those Ubuntu commands that you know should function just fine here, and you can go to the terminal uh, to do those types of things. Again, that might be a good way for installing software and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a text editor down here, just a normal text editor. Uh, we have help, help. Uh, then we go to preferences. So we have add or remove software here. So this is a place where you can go and you can add and remove different types of software. Again, whether or not you want to go through this process or if you just want to install it from the command line, that's up to you. But they got, you know, publishing software. They've got different types of desktop, the GNOME desktop, the KDE desktop, those types of things. So you may want to come in here and do some modifications. I don't find this to be the Oh, most user-friendly way of doing things, uh, but it does, this does exist. Uh, if we want to go up here again, we go back down to preferences, uh, appearance settings. So if we click on appearance settings, uh, that's where we can modify um, basically the layout of the screen, uh, things that will actually show up uh, on the desktop. So uh, if we wanted documents to show up on the desktop, now documents show up on the desktop here, whether the waste paper, waste, waste basket does, mounted disks, so on and so forth. If we go over to the menu bar, uh, we can modify the size of the menu bar. So currently it's large. I can make it very large. So that makes it really big. I could make it small. That makes it really small. Or I could go back and put it to medium or, uh, or large again. Uh, position, top, or bottom, you know, where you decide to go. Um, and then location. So you will see HDMI 1 here and HDMI 2. So I actually have essentially um, two screens plugged into this particular Raspberry Pi. One of the screens is the monitor that I'm actually using. And then one of the screens is how you were viewing this monitor. Uh, so that shows you that you have the, the two uh, the two screens actually plugged into the Raspberry Pi. Past that, we can go to system. Uh, here are things like font. So you know what font do you want for the text? If you want to modify that, highlight color, mouse cursor, whole nine yards. And then we can go to the defaults. Uh, so here for you can set for large screens. 
Um, so if you want to make everything big, you can click on the for large screens. If you want it for medium screens, you can click on for medium screens. And if you want it for small screens, you can click on for small screens. And that, that's basically a simple way. You're like, oh, this is a large screen. Let me just click, click on the large screen. Or if it's a medium screen, let me just click on that. And it will modify the fonts. It will modify a lot of stuff for you. Uh, so that's some of the basic appearance settings. As with all of it, you can go through and play with it. Uh, then we'll go down for preferences. You know, you got the keyboard and mouse. Basically the same type of keyboard and mouse stuff that you deal with with any operating system. Uh, then we go down, uh, then we have the main menu editor. So this might be useful for you. So the menu, you know, this is the menu right here. So if you want to deal with the main menu editor, you can come in here. You can modify like what shows up. So do you want Genie to show up? So right now, if you click on uh, this, you know, we get Genie and we got the Thonny Python. If we didn't want Genie, we could simply uncheck that. Then we click OK. And then we go here to programming and now only the Thonny uh, Python IDE shows up. So this can be a useful way just to, to modify this desktop so that it only gives you what you actually need. You can do some modifications in there. Uh, then we're going to go down to preferences again. Then we go to the Raspberry Pi configuration. And so this is uh, something that you may want to go to uh, if you're going to be doing more complicated projects. So with the Raspberry Pi configuration, a lot of this is just kind of the default standard stuff. Uh, so this is where you can change your password. This is where you can change your host name. This is where you can say boot into, do you want to boot into the desktop or boot into the cli? Again, remember, this is simply a Debian operating system. So if you want to use it more as just a server, you would have it boot into the cli. Do you want to have it auto login? <laughs> security, security, security. Do you want it to auto login or do you not want it to auto login? So this is uh, auto login to Pi. Uh, do you want to wait for the network on boot? Do you want to enable or disable splash screen? So this is where you're going to do a lot of that basic administration. And then we're going to go to uh, the display. Uh, not a lot of stuff here. Uh, then we're going to go to interfaces. This is going to be an important one for projects that you're going to be creating. So if you're installing the Raspberry Pi operating system and then you're going to be doing a lot of different projects with the Raspberry Pi, this is where you actually allow different interfaces faces to be able to connect with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so things such as camera. So if you're going to be connecting a camera, so for machine vision type projects with the Raspberry Pi, you need to make sure that you actually enable it. <laughs> Again, you, you plug it in, you write the code, and you're like, why isn't it working? Because you didn't enable it. SSH. So again, if you want to enable SSH for Raspberry Pi, this is where you would enable it. VNC. So you'll see, you'll see a lot of projects where people talk about basically just simply using VNC to access the Raspberry Pi. You actually need to enable it here. I, uh, SPI, I2C, serial port, so on and so forth. Remote GPIO. So with remote GPIO, this is pretty cool. This is where you can have other Raspberry Pis actually be able to control the GPIO pins on this Raspberry Pi. So that's the type of thing that you actually need to enable. So the interfaces, probably out of the, uh, the Raspberry Pi configuration, the most important thing is the uh, system here. This is where you change your password and all that. And then interfaces. This, this is what will make you rip out whatever hair you have left. Because you'll connect something, you'll write all the code, it will not work. And you'll be like, what the f***? And the reason is, is because you did not enable the interface. So do remember this. Do remember this particular page. Past that, you just got some performance things you can sit here and try to play with if you really want to. And then localization, you know, time zone, keyboard, Wi-Fi country, so on and so forth. Uh, past that, we can then simply keep going down. Uh, and then we see the recommended software. And so they have the ad remove software here. I want to honestly really mess with this. It's kind of bloated and, and annoying and more of a pain in the butt. Again, I would just use the command line if I need to install something. But one of the interesting things here is I have the recommended software. So basically, uh, if you're going to be using the Raspberry Pi, this is a software that they're pretty sure will work well for your particular situation. And so here they just give you some options. So they get they have a mail client. So if you want a mail client, they have a mail client here, an IDE for the Java programming language, uh, LibreOffice. Uh, so it used to be called OpenOffice, or there's a version, I guess, it's called OpenOffice, and now they have LibreOffice. So if you want an office, so the equivalent of Word, the equivalent of Excel, that type of thing, you have LibreOffice here. And basically Minecraft, <laughs> if you want to do Minecraft and that type of thing. And so basically that's a cool thing with the recommended software is this is all that basic software um, that you may actually really want to use with the Raspberry Pi. Also, again, if you're going to be uh, going onto the internet, 
you're going to be looking for different projects, different tutorials. Many times they will tell you to use some of this different software such as Scratch. So you'll see a lot, you'll see a lot of tutorials that talk about using Scratch. So this is where you can come in is you can simply install the version of Scratch that you need for whatever tutorial that you're going to use. And you don't have to go through and try to pull it down from a repository or anything like that. And that's really about what you've got with the Raspberry Pi. Um, the final thing here is the screen configuration. Um, and this is, this is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this this was designed by a Linux administrator. Um, so one of the first things that I'll say is if you are going to be trying to do classes like I am, um, you can't simply mirror the screens. So I have HDMI 1. So HDMI 1 plugs into the actual monitor that I'm personally viewing. HDMI 2 plugs into my computer that's recording this class. In order to mirror a screen, you take HDMI 2, and you drag and drop it over HDMI 1, and yay, that is how you mirror a screen. <laughs> Not even joking. <laughs> Who came up with that idea? Anyways, so again, when you're using the Raspberry Pi OS, it's, there are some interesting things with how it was designed. Uh, if you want to modify the resolution, you can right-click on either one of the screens that you have connected. Basically, right-click here so you can do the resolution. You can modify the resolution to whatever you want to modify it to. Frequency, if you can do frequency, and then orientation here. So if you want to modify the orientation. Uh, again, like with resolution here, one of the things you'll notice is for resolution, it'll basically tell you what's available with the screen that you're connected to. So HDMI 1, again, is just connected to just a, a crappy, you know, five-year-old monitor. And so you see basically it maxes out at 1080p. If I go over to HDMI 2 and I go to resolution, you can see I can go all the way up to 4K. So you have all of these different resolution options here. And so basically, if you're looking for a resolution and it does not show up in this dropdown, it, what that means is that the screen that you're dealing with cannot handle that particular resolution so just kind of keep that in mind uh, yeah frequency if you want to modify that and then again uh, the orientation normal right inverted so on and so forth and then again like I said if you want to mirror the screen you mirror the screen by doing this uh, again for locations of screens you know you can you can do all kinds of weird you know locations of you know where the screens are gonna be you can uh, play around with that uh, just be careful. <laughs> just just be careful. Uh, and then finally, all you have to do is once you've modified everything, uh, how you want it to be modified, you just simply click on this checkbox here, and that will that will do the modifications. That will apply the modifications. Just like in the Windows world, it'll give you 20 or 30 seconds. Um, if you say everything is good, uh, it'll keep the settings. If you don't respond or if you hit cancel, it will revert back to your old settings. Uh, beyond that, there's not really too much else here. View, you know, one by four, one by eight, or one by sixteen, and so on and so forth. And so basically, uh, this is what we're dealing with uh, with these different um, options here. And basically, this is what the operating system looks like. You have run. So again, if you just basically want to do a run command, and then the final thing here is if you want to shut down your Raspberry Pi, you come here to log out. And then from the log out option, you get shut down, reboot, or log out. So if you simply want to log out, you can log out or reboot, something you'll probably need to do a lot, and then shut down. That will actually shut down the Raspberry Pi, and that's where you do it from. And so that's a bit of an overview of what the Raspberry Pi operating system looks like. Again, a nice, a nice simple, pretty easy to use uh, graphical user interface. Uh, the, make, the, the big things to remember is just when we come down here to preferences, you come here to Raspberry Pi configurations, Raspberry Pi configuration, this will give you system information, so host name, password, uh, desktop or CLI, all of that. And then the big one is interfaces. So th this, this is one of the things that may make you lose your mind is if you're doing some types of projects and for whatever reason you cannot connect or your device is not working on your Raspberry Pi, most likely the interface that whatever you're using requires has not been enabled. So that's a bit of an overview. And uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's Linux. <laughs> it's Linux. If you're, if you're used to li dealing with kind of crappy Linux goo, this will be right up your alley. So there you go. Now you know how to use the Raspberry Pi operating system. Woo! Again, if you've been in the technology world for a little while and you're used to, to dealing with a kind of crappy, simplistic uh, distributions of Linux, this is right up your alley. It's like, oh, wow. 
It's an ugly, ugly, ugly distribution of Linux. I know how to interact with this one. Uh, so for the most part, again, it's just it's just an ugly distribution of Linux. Um, the important thing to to remember, again, if you're going to be using a command line, is that it is a Debian uh, distribution of Linux. So it's off the Debian fork. So if you're used to dealing with the Debian or Ubuntu, all of the commands, more or less, that you know should work fine. Again, to install software, uh, to deal with network configurations, to start and restart and stop services. Uh, most of this stuff should should work fine again if you're work, you're you're used to dealing with Ubuntu or the Debian world. Uh, the only place you're going to run into some quirky things is again uh, with the Raspberry Pi OS. If you're going to be connecting the i2 uh, any kind of i2c devices to the Raspberry Pi, if you're going to be trying to connect in with VNC, if you're going to be trying to do SSH, some of that other stuff, do realize you have to go to that configuration panel and actually enable those services to allow that to happen. Uh, but beyond that, again, it's a pretty simplistic little operating system you can go in there you can start to play you can build stuff and see what happens uh, the question as to whether you should continue to use the Raspberry Pi operating system uh, or go to a different operating system after you you feel pretty comfortable using a Raspberry Pi really comes down to your preferences and your environment again this is a Debian version of Linux it's it's a fine it's a it's a fine enough version of Linux right if you're going to be uh, powering sensor suites if you're going to be doing powering like things like digital displays that type of thing uh, this distribution of Linux should should actually be be fine for you again I will probably be showing people how to use uh, Ubuntu going into the future simply because I have a whole series of Ubuntu classes up until this point and I will kind of keep everybody on the exact same track so it is important to understand just you know it's, it's one of those things in the technology world you know you use the tool that, that solves your problem, that fixes your problem. And so honestly, if the Raspberry Pi OS solves your problem and within your environment does everything that you need it to do, just stick with the Raspberry Pi by OS, right? You do not have to go over to a different operating system. Uh, but again, like I say, if, if there's a reason, if you've been doing standardization or something like that, to go over to a different operating system, you might think about doing that. It's just kind of one of those things that you have to think about. Uh, so yeah, that's really all there is to the Raspberry Pi operating system. Go, play, see what works, see what doesn't work. Again, do not do not default to believing that the hardware is necessarily the bottleneck for whatever problem that you're running into. Again, since this is a Raspberry Pi, since it's an inexpensive, small, little power efficient computer, it's really easy to assume that if the uh, system is running slow, it's you know a crappy CPU or crappy RAM, something like that like that. Uh, in reality, it might be bad code. It might be a bad uh, micro SD card. You may be running into some kind of other issues. You may have a bad network cable. Again, what you know, just like you grab that dusty micro SD card off the shelf, you may have grabbed a 10 or 15 year old patch cable off the shelf. You shove that in and that patch cable is working, right? So again, so if you're trying to connect to the network or if you're having network devices connect to the Raspberry Pi and you have a, you know, a crappy old patch cable, the problem that you may be having is actually that patch cable and not the unit itself. So do make sure to go into Task Manager, uh, take a look, make sure, see where the CPU is at, see where the memory is at, go in, do the diagnostics on the SD card, actually troubleshoot and verify that the problem is the hardware uh, before you assume that that the problem is the hardware because again I've seen a lot of times you may have a bad switch you may have a bad patch cable you may just have really 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 crappy code especially if you're writing your own code like if you're getting code off the shelf it should be fine but if you're if you're using your own code you may have a loop in your code somewhere that you forgot about and that that's burning up uh, burning up processing time and all that so these are some things to think about before before you assume that the Raspberry Pi is just just not powerful enough for whatever you need it to do. So anyways, with that, as always, I enjoyed doing this class. Look forward to seeing the next one. If you like the content that I create, please think about going to elinethecomputerguy.com and becoming a member or donating. Please understand that all the educational videos are in front of the paywall. That includes the videos, that includes the notes, the diagrams, and the code example. All of that is freely available and in front of the paywall. But if you want to watch opinion videos or if you want to be able to comment, you do need to become a member. Membership is $5 a month or $60 a year and gives you access to those opinion videos and the ability uh, to comment. If you don't want to become a member, you just want to give a one-time uh, donation, there is also a donate button where you can do that. Please understand, in order to provide the education that I am, it does cost money.
servers cost money, equipment costs money, travel costs money. All of these things cost a reasonable amount of money. And the fact of the matter is, is YouTube's advertising program no longer supports creators the way that it used to. So if you want to these classes to continue to stick around and you find them to be valuable, please think about either becoming a monthly member or donating a few dollars for this project.